So we are here with John Jeffrey today. Now, now your story in, in the Kiss world is a little different. You you didn't work for the band. You're you're not you know Paul Stanley's personal assistant. You're you're not a roadie. Uh, you're just a fan. And, yeah. Yeah. And as a fan, you started something sort of pre-internet, or you were part of something called the Kiss Underground, which was a fanzine. And of course. You know, anybody who's like 14 and listening to this are going to go, well, what, what's a fanzine? Well, you actually put together a little newspaper dedicated to KISS. And so so let's start right there. What compelled you to put together a fanzine for KISS? Why not just be a fan with a poster on your wall? Well, you know, I, I was a fan uh, with a poster on my wall, uh, many posters uh, to be, uh, you know, <laughs> precise. But my thing was, was that when I got to about uh, 15 years old, I was so much into the band right. that like a lot of fans probably, uh, you know, um, who are my age or, or maybe even, you know, older fans who, you know, were my age, but years prior, you know, my thing was, is I got to the point where I was so into the band that I wanted to actually meet the band and talk to the band and, you know, ask them questions about things that I always wanted to know about about the band right. and, and and i was you know very well read i i would you know go out and get all the you know magazines that would you know i'd go to the local supermarket and i'd get all the magazines the hip raiders you know circus, uh, circus Metal all Edge. those yeah well actually this was even i think before i think metal edge didn't actually start coming out until maybe the later part of the 80s True. but this was like you know early on and you know and the unfortunate part of those magazines is you would literally have to buy you know a full magazine and you'd get like about a quarter inch right up on kiss you right. know you get very little information on the band and so at the same time where my mission, my end goal, I guess you'd say would be, was I wanted to meet the band at the same time. I was always thinking, it's like, wouldn't it be great if as a kiss fan, you could get a magazine or a newsletter of some sort that was just kiss. Right. So instead of having to go and go through a whole magazine of, you know, bands that I really didn't care about, you know, I, I just would really go through all the pages till I found, okay, this is the part about Kiss and would read what was going on with the band, you know? So, um, you know, th that was also an, another uh, kind of, um, uh, I guess you'd say, motivational factor to want to put together, um, you know, the Kiss Underground. But w the main driving force, I have to admit, was I really wanted to meet the band. And what I did is um, back when people remember vinyl Kiss albums, if well, you pull they're, out... they're all coming out this spring, the vinyl Kiss albums. That's right. <laughs> That's right. But pe people remember they came out the first time right. when you'd pull out the inner sleeve... It would say at the bottom, Kiss is managed by Glickman Marks, and it would have the address. So what I did is I called back, and, you know, it, this was obviously pre-internet and pre, you know, Google and everything else. Is yeah, I called the information, and I got the phone number for Glickman and Marks, which happened to be the Kiss offices. And I talked to the secretaries, and they're always very nice to me. And you know, they're they're probably kind of surprised that you know, at the time, like I said, being 15, you know, they could tell by my voice that I was a, a younger kid, you know. And I'm calling them, and they're always really nice and polite. And and I told them straightforward, you know, like I, I want to meet Kiss, I want to talk to them. What would I have to do in order for that to happen? And they pretty much told me in order to talk to kiss they only talk to people who are in the media right and i'm like so if i had like say for example my own magazine i would be able to talk to kiss and they said yes so yeah. then like i was saying before, yeah like i said before i was at the same time i was thinking what how great it would be 
to have some sort of, you know, magazine or what have you that was just all KISS information. Right. So I thought, well, why don't I put one together? But, but let me stop you there for a second. Sure. So, so you, you have the motivation, meet KISS. Right. You have the concept, magazine all about KISS. But, but then you've got the problem of content. You, you've got to now come up with something every month, every two months, whatever it is. But it's also got to be somewhat true. I mean, you can't be talking about the new Kiss album that's coming out next month that really isn't coming out next month. So, right. So where, how did you go about getting the information and getting the, the contact and, and setting up you know, the printing? and uh, Walk me through that whole process. Because, okay, you've got the sure. idea, you've got the motivation, but you've also you, you got to have the goods. You've got to deliver the goods, right? That's right. That's right. So actually what I did is I sought out... Um, like I said previously, you know, reading, you know, the magazines like Hip Raider and Circus, they would have, you know, classified ads in the back of the magazines. And in those classifieds, there were advertisements for other fan run KISS fan clubs that were going on at the time. And actually one of the first ones that I can recall was actually one that was run by the guy who is running the KISS online website right now, Keith LaRue. Okay. He had a KISS fan club called the KISS Force that he ran with a guy named David Snowden, who actually went on to work for Vinnie Vincent and run his fan club right. uh, many years later. But they had the KISS Force, and I contacted them, and there was also another uh, KISS fan-run fan club called the Kiss Alliance that was run by Chris and Andrew Allen. And um, the Allen brothers, along with uh, Dave and Keith, were very instrumental in, in giving me the information um, as far as what I needed to do to actually go forward and actually uh, putting together a newsletter, because that's what the KISS Underground initially was. It was a, um, an eight-page newsletter that was uh, printed. And, you know, they told me what I needed to do in terms of, uh, you know, like when you have photographs for print material back then, you needed to have what were called half tones. Right. So, again, I, I went to the phone book and information and called around and, and found out where I could, you know, have photographs um, converted into half tones. And, you know, uh, as far as like the actual text, I, the original Kiss Underground newsletter was uh, an old typewriter that I actually, you know, sat there and typed myself and, you know, and figured out the layout and had, you know, photos that I had purchased that, to my knowledge, were never printed in any other, uh, you know, magazine Where did or you publication. Um, I'm trying to think. I think it was, again, it was, it was another one of those, um, you know, hip parade or circus classifieds where, you know, you could send away. Oh, yeah, and, I remember and I you, did those. Yeah, and you could get, like, a handful of, like, you know, kiss, you know, four by six or five by seven kiss photos. And, um, you know, and, and that's what I used to, you know, before I was able to, you know, go out there and cover shows myself and have my exclusive, you know, photographs. Um, that's what I used to get started for the uh, first editions of the Kiss Underground. By the way, just listening to your story, it, it's amazing the length at which people like yourself went in these pre-internet days, I mean, now you just, you know, you Google kiss picture and six million things pop up and you, sure. snap. but back then you actually had to buy a magazine, send a letter with a money order or, or a check from your mom or whatever, right. walk down to the post. I mean, it was a whole, I mean, it, it really just goes to show the level of dedication that, that you and, and people like Keith and, 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 and Snowden, everybody had to, to make these things come to life. Um, okay, so, so, so you've got these pictures. Um, where do you go from there? Now, you've got the first issue printed up. How do you go about reaching fans? I mean, now you go on the internet and you go, hey, I've got a, a web show or a podcast, and you throw it on your Facebook and people subscribe, but how did people find the Kiss Underground? You were underground. Right. Well, you know, actually, I, I would have to say... Um, the success of the Kiss Underground 
real as far as building up a fan base really didn't come on until later into um you know after after putting out you know uh several issues you know several years after the fact um where what what wound up happening is that once i established a relationship with kiss right. they actually would help me um by advertising the kiss underground in various magazines, like they would, you know, they would have like these all kiss magazines, like kiss on tour and right. stuff like that. And they would actually tell the publishers about the fanzine and they would actually put in for free. You know, I didn't have to pay for any of this, which I, which I thought was amazing. Right. They would actually promote the kiss underground. Um, okay. okay you know, well, stop. Why, why, why do they care about, John Jeffrey and the Kiss Underground. Why, why are they doing this? Did they ever tell you? I mean, did they have a marketing plan? Did they just think you were a nice guy? I mean, why, why do they care? You know, I, I, I think what it is, is they, they, they told me, uh, Gene Simmons specifically told me um, several times, you know, when we we'd do interviews and, and he would, at the end, before we'd hang up, he goes, you know, John, I really appreciate talking to people like you more than any other people who are talking to, you know, say Kiss is one of, you know, the 10 or 20 bands that they talk to, you know, that week or, or what have you, because you really have a passion for our band and we really appreciate your dedication and loyalty to the band. So as much as they get criticized for, you know, how much they're about the money and so forth, I, I really think that, especially with Gene Simmons, the fact that he produced his own um, fan magazines, horror fan magazines mm-hmm. when he was younger, that I, I think that was part of it, that he appreciated, uh, again, you know, somebody my age, you know. Well, being how old were you the at time. the time? I, I was 15 years old wow. when I had okay. started. Okay, but yeah. did I miss a step here? I mean, first you're here, you're getting pictures for mail order pictures and all that. How do we go from mail order pictures to Gene Simmons on the phone with you? Okay. So what happened was that once I had, uh, you know, an actual physical, you oh. know, Kiss Underground oh, right. number one in my hand, I'm like, okay, now step number two. They said for me to talk to Kiss and to meet Kiss, I need to have, you know, my own Kiss magazine or publication. Now I have it. So I sent it to them. And they received it, and they thought it was great. And uh, the very first thing that they did for me is they set up an interview, a telephone interview with Eric Carr. And he was the very first member of KISS that I wound up interviewing. And this was actually, um, I believe this was right before the Crazy Nights album was released. Oh, let's clear up one thing for listeners. Sure. You ran the magazine from 1987 to 2007, so 20 years. So, so we're, correct. So we're all within that time frame. We're not talking about animalized. We're not talking about creatures of the. We're really talking 87 to 2007. So, That's right. so, so they got Eric Carr on the phone with you. Now, you, you've now reached your goal. You, you, you've gotten to have a phoner, as they call it, with with one of your heroes. Right. How, how was that experience? Well, it was, it was great. I mean, and as many people know, or I should say if they don't know, I mean, Eric Carr would have to be, if not the, one of the most fan friendly members of the band. And I'm not saying that as a, 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 a diss well, I'm or I'm going to correct slight. you on that. Eric Carr is one of the most fan-friendly, nicest people just as a human being around the globe. Forget Kiss bands. He, he, he was just one of the most um, wonderful people that you'll meet in any walk of life. He, he was just, I, he, I agree 100%. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he was just, uh, I mean, you know, he, I, I can't go on as... I don't even know how to describe him. He was just so nice. Let's just go with that. He was just so so nice. He he was, and and you know, and when I put it in the context of the band, I'm just saying it in terms of how I lucked out. Right. That my first interview with a member of Kiss happened to be, yeah, I would say, if not the one of the most fan friendliest members right. of of the group. 
And, you know, and, and, and again, it's not a slight towards anybody else who's, no. who's been a past or present member of the band. It just, some people tend to have more, I guess, be more personable. And he was the most personable member of the band. Absolutely. And, and, and again, I, I think the f- a fact that he acknowledged that, you know, at the time, you know, like I said, I was 15 or maybe at this point, 16 years old. And I'm talking to, you know, Eric Carr and I'm asking him, you know, well, at least what I perceived as being fairly intelligent questions, you know, I'm not asking, you know, why did Kiss take off the makeup is, you know, is Gene's tongue a, a cow's tongue that was, you know, Hey, what's wrong with that and... question? I asked that to Gene when I did my, my interview when I was 11. I said, why did Kiss take off the makeup? That was a good question. Well, you, well, you I, I thought you asked them would they not perform without the makeup, which I thought was a good question. No, listen, when I interviewed uh, Gene that first time, it was it was 1980, it was right. June, it was before the Palladium show, before they had announced Eric Carr, and um, no, I, I said, why do you wear makeup? That's what That was the question. That was the question. Why do you wear makeup? But, right, and because I, I listened to that, and it was, and I thought, I, I thought you came off very intelligent, especially for your age, and I think Gene yeah. treated you very well, and um, I, I think what, what, how the way that the question actually evolved when you're talking to him was whether or not people would um, accept the band w- without makeup. Right. And, and, and then from that point, I mean, that was obviously, this was while they were wearing the makeup. So I think for you at that age to ask the question of, you know, at that point, there was no signs of them, you know, Take unmasking or anything right. like that. Even though the, later on they did have an album called Unmasked, even though that had nothing to do with them taking off the makeup. No, but that was um, the interview. It, it was for an unmasked interview. Right. Right. So, but I, I think, I think the, the fact that you went that far into the thought process at the age that you were, I thought that was a good question. But m- what I was saying was that, you know, I, is there, there could have been questions that I could have asked that could have been, you know, uninformed or just mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, uh, childish type questions. But I, I felt looking back at that time that I really wanted to come across, you know, even though I didn't even know what the extent of what a journalist is or was, I didn't want to come across as just, I'm just some 16 year old kiss fan, just asking mundane questions. I really wanted to, to prove to Eric that I knew, I knew my stuff. I knew my kiss, you know, and that's what I wanted to, you know, so he didn't feel like he was wasting his time. And, um, you know, I, I think it was, it was a good interview and it was the first of many that I had, uh, the opportunity to do with Eric. And I was actually fortunate to be one of the few people to interview Eric right before he died. So that, that was, uh, you know, the beginning of, of a, a, a very nice relationship with a, a great human being. Do you think that throughout this, uh, you developed friendships with, with any of the band members? Or was it always, he's the fanzine guy, we're the band, we work together, but we're nothing more than that? Or, or was it like, hey, there's John, hey, come on out to the, you know, come on out to the show, let's, let's hang out at the hotel? Or how did the relationship develop? Well, I I think essentially what had happened was that um, once I started getting the opportunity to meet the band, Mm -hmm. which was my next goal, you know, like I said, you know, I wanted to, to talk to them and I wanted to meet them. So once I had, you know, goal number one was essentially having to create the magazine in order to, you know, achieve the other goals that I had set, you know, and then I got the opportunity to interview Eric Carr. And then the next step, you know, in, in the scenario was being able to meet the band. And, uh, the first time I got to meet the band was backstage, um, in Toronto for the crazy nights tour in December of 1987. That was the first time. And then the second time I got to meet them uh, when they came to Buffalo um, in January of 88. And then throughout the whole process, ironically, 
I mean, I, I don't want to take any credit for this happening, but ironically, after, you know, I started the Kiss Underground fanzine, there was tons of fanzines that started popping up in the latter part of the 80s. Um, so much to the point that they actually had created a what was called Kiss Central, which was run by uh, a woman named Jolda Caserta, who actually also went on to work for Ace Frehley for the Rock Soldiers fan club. Okay. Um, but Jolda was the one who was actually the head of Kiss Central, which was an organization that basically kind of um, organized all of the KISS fanzines and fan clubs to make it easier um, for the band to kind of work with them, you know, as opposed to what I did, you know, calling their, their management offices and, you know, requesting things. It just got to the point where there was so many fanzines at a certain point where they actually created a KISS Central, you know, to be able to, to manage the amount of um, fan clubs and fanzines that there were out there, you know, being put out for Kiss. So it was sort of like an official clearinghouse where they would say, okay, we have a new album coming out. Let's send out this information to these 10 different fanzines and then they'll send it off to their fans kind of thing. So it was it was it a, an official kind of organization or quasi official or um I I would I would say quasi official okay. because they, there was never any, um, you know, rules. There was never, you know, it was just very, um, it was very organic, okay. you know. Um, it wasn't organized in the sense that every month the band or the band's management would send you a little nugget. It was, it was sort of there and existed when it was needed kind of thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. And, um, you know, I, and what happened actually that was really cool was during the Hot in the Shade tour, um, they actually did a, a show, I guess you would say an infamous show at the CNE grandstands in June of 1990, where they were initially supposed to be doing their own headlining show. And at the same time, within the same month, uh, White Snake was supposed to have their own headlining show, right. and I guess the ticket sales were kind of soft for both shows. And what the promoter wound up doing was combining the two separate headlining shows and had Kiss performing with White, White Snake, Snake, and Kiss wound up being the opening act for that show, which caused uh, some interesting onstage banter between Paul Stanley and David Coverdale uh, for that show because Kiss wasn't allowed to use um, any of their real staging or lighting for right. that show. And the ego ramps and all that wonderful stuff. Yeah. And, but the cool thing was, even though that, that was kind of like a weird thing for the band, um, for that show, there was a special, um, Kiss Central kind of event where any of the, um, you know, editors or publishers of the Kiss fanzines or fan clubs were allowed to go backstage after the Kiss performance and got to meet the entire band. And the thing that was really cool about that is people may not know, but a lot of times when you got to meet Kiss, like during the 80s, and this is before, you know, you had to pay anything, just right. going back there and, and meeting them. We call it the it good was, old days. Yeah, the good old days. It was a very rare occasion that Paul Stanley would be back there. Um, yeah. From my understanding is Paul had um, a fear of, a semi large groups of people. Okay. So if there was like a lot of people in the backstage area, he wouldn't come out. So like generally when you got the opportunity to meet the band and, and not that it was negative by any means. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, getting to meet Gene Simmons, Bruce Kulick, Eric Carr on a semi regular occasion tour to tour. I mean, to me, that was great. And, but and let's be fair. Let's be fair to Paul too. Also, cause I've met a lot of bands backstage, and the lead singer doesn't come out for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they want to save their voice before going on stage. Sometimes sure. they want to make sure they don't catch a cold, or you know, it, th there's reasons why lead singers will stay away from meeting fans, and it's not because they hate them. It's because 
you know, it can affect the performance or, or you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons. So, but it's not, Paul's not the only one who does that. I mean, I've, I've seen that over and over and over again. Sure, sure. And again, it's it's not a criticism. I mean, like, again, from exactly. what, I was, what, what I was told is that he did have a, a phobia of large crowds. And right. when, the, when there were smaller groups of the meet and greets, those were the times when Paul would come out when there were smaller groups. So again, I mean, take it for what it's worth. I'm just telling you what, what I was told right. regarding the situation. Right. Um, so again, that time when they did the special Kiss Central um, meet and greet in Toronto, it was special in that all four band members were present and they spent a lot of time talking to the fans, um, posing for pictures, signing autographs, you know, doing the whole thing. And it wasn't a rushed situation at all. It was a very casual, very cool situation where you actually felt like you're hanging out with Kiss for a period of time. And the fact that they did it for, you know, essentially you know, anybody who was part of that Kiss Central at the time, I thought that there was a, a really nice thing that they did for their fans. Oh, absolutely, you know, and, it, you know, it's great. So, so let, let's go into some of the other things. Have you interviewed every single member of the band? I have. Um, I have interviewed... I, 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 let me let me actually back up. Okay. I've been part of interviews with every single member of Kiss who's ever been in and out of Kiss, all... 10 guys um specifically with mark st john when i was i was actually part of a question and answer session that he did for one of the uh kiss expos that he started doing in the late uh 1990s so i never had Toronto by any chance um no actually this okay. one was in philadelphia okay. i believe of 99 and that that q a i was part of it but i didn't you know conduct the interview one-on-one -on -one. but aside from him i've had one-on-one -on -one interviews with all the all the guys maybe this is an unfair question but did, but did any of them strike you as nicer more interesting more than the others or was it pretty much the same experience with all of them hey i'm talking to a guy in kiss that's all that that's good enough for me you know i'd have to say if, if we have time i i could go through each guy and kind of give you a little bit of a, a synopsis of what yeah, it was yeah, like let, let's, let's go i mean that that's what that's, okay. i think that's what fans like to hear okay sure with, with gene G gene is different depending on what mode he's in if gene is say for example if he's doing press day mm -hmm. where he's set up that day while he's on tour to talk to you know 10 other journalists you're going to get a very short non-responsive gene simmons you're going to get yes and no questions if you try to give him too much of like say a backstory on a question right. to explain it to him he'll just say no 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 just go right to the question just ask me the question. And then usually his response, again, is very short and very, uh, very contrite. Do you um, think that's because he, he, he's disinterested? Or do you think he just understands that a sound bite sells more than a convoluted 18-minute answer? Well, I think it is. It's just, he, honestly, I think it's just for, for him. I think it's interview burnout. Gotcha. You know, okay. he's just doing so many interviews in a day that he just wants to make sure that, you know, whatever time slot you have, say you're speaking from him from 3 to 3.15, that he can go through and make sure he answers every question that you have within that time frame. Okay. Um, but if you get Gene on a day, I mean, for example, when I would interview, say, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley up till just a few years ago, where the procedure is slightly different now, um, what I would essentially do if I wanted to talk to them is I would fax an interview request to their assistant in New Jersey. Angus. And I, and I would say, I want to do an interview. I, it's been some time since I talked to you guys. I really would like to do an interview. And there would be no set time. Just I'd be sitting around my apartment and I'd get a call from Gene Simmons or Paul Stanley. And they say, you know, we got your facts. 
you know, and they would sit there and talk to me. And so, depending so, so, on hold how. Hold on a second. So, so sure. Gene wouldn't say, I'm calling you at three. He would just say, I'm calling you Monday. And you would just wait around the house all day for the phone call. No, I, I would. I would not even know what day they were calling. Oh. I would I would just tell them that I would like to interview them and for them to contact me. And they would pick That's whatever funny. time was convenient for them. And most of the time, it happened to be they would call me when I was home. I did have a couple times where I was out and I got, I came home and, you know, my mother would, you know, at the time when I was living at home, my mother would be like, yeah, Gene Simmons called for you earlier. And I'd be like, oh, I mean, <laughs> you know, not knowing if he was going to call me back again, right. you know. Um, but I mean, for the most part, I lucked out that when they would call me, there would be times when, you know, I would be available and I'd be home and, you know, and we'd wind up doing the interview. All right. So, so. We know about Gene. Let, let me start with, with, let's work it this way. Uh, Eric okay. Carr, how was he? Eric Carr, again, most personal member of the band. He would literally sit there and talk to you all day if he had the time. I mean, literally. He, he would. It would never be to a point where he'd say, you know, John, I've got to go. I'm sorry. It would just literally be until you got to the point where you felt you were infringing on his time. You know, you'd set it to a point and say, okay, well, I appreciate the time you've given me. And then you four know, hours th later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Tommy exactly. Thayer. Tommy Thayer. Um, Tommy, my experience with him is most of the interviews that I've done with Tommy have been through actually a, a Q and a type format where I would send him the questions via email. Again, this is dealing with the uh, current, uh, you know, uh, current days, you know, with, uh, you know, using the internet and so forth. And, you know, I would, you know, mostly with Tommy, I would email him questions and then he would email me back his response. That, so I don't have that, that much. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I had one interview with Tommy myself, and it was the exact same thing. I emailed him the questions, and he emailed me back the answers. That, that's interesting. Yes. So for Tommy, I, I can't really give you um, that much of an insight as far as, I mean, I've had other times where I've spent time with Tommy, and we've sat down and we we've talked about kiss and you know he's given me information that i was able to use um you know for the kiss underground at the time um you know but as far as you know like most of my experience with um tommy with interviewing it's more of like Q and A, and it's you know it very you know kind of short to the point answers. He doesn't seem to go too much um, in depth. But but, but that um, said, he did write you back. I mean that you, you got to oh you yeah gotta, you gotta yeah score points for that. I mean it it goes to show that you know he he, he he's not above it all, and and that he's he wants to help out, and he's he's taking care of a fanzine. That I, I, I don't know that that sounds to me like a good guy, if you ask me. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, again, it's not a criticism. Right. It's just that due to the way that we conducted, you know, most of the, the interviews that I've done with him have been that way. I can't really provide too much of an insight right. as far as, you know, what he's like to, to interview because I haven't had the same type of opportunities with him that I have with the other members of KISS. Right. Bruce Kulik. Bruce Kulik, again... He's a great guy. He'll literally sit there and talk to you as long as you want. And he's not a, he's not afraid of answering anything, you know? I mean, obviously as long as it's not anything disrespectful, um, which I, you know, I've never, you know, to my knowledge, never asked him anything that was disrespectful, but, um, you know, I mean, as long as you're, you know, cool with him, he's cool with you. And, um, you know, he, he's a very straightforward interview. Peter Chris. Peter Chris. Um, I'd have to say my Peter Chris interview was probably the most negative experience that I've ever experienced as far as a Kiss interview. Not as Peter Chris as a whole as a member of Kiss, 
because I had many nice experiences meeting Peter, especially on his last tour right. with Kiss on the World Domination. He was a really nice guy, and he was very nice to the fans um, throughout that final tour he did with Kiss. But my interview with Peter was actually in 19, 1994 uh, here in Buffalo, New York. It was uh, after a show that they did at uh, a club called Impacts. Right. And the thing about this show, it was in December, and it was only maybe two or three days after his father had passed away. And I was a lot of people, when they found out that his father passed away, they were unsure if the show was actually going to happen. Right. So when I... Yeah, and, and also knowing that I had an interview set up, I was unsure if that interview was even going to happen. So when I got backstage and we got set up and, you know, started doing the interview, the first thing that he did that kind of like threw me off guard is he wanted me to interview the rest of his band first. And at the time, I wasn't even for certain who was in the band because he had um, band member changes even from when he had yeah. released the Chris album, right. the Chris Cat one CD that came out at the time. So I didn't even know for certain who was in the band. And again, my interview was arranged with the label to interview Peter Chris. Not oh, was that through Tony Chris. Nicole Records? Yes, TNT <laughs> Records, yes. So again, I, you know, and I, it's not that I had a problem with it. I just wasn't prepared to, to do that. Right. So I'm um, essentially meeting these people that I had not prepared any questions for. And Peter, on his request, asked me to interview those guys first. Right. And especially so I harder, did, if you I'm don't sorry? know the, it's especially hard when you don't know their backstory. I mean, you know, if somebody says, sit down with Gene Simmons, you go, oh, okay, well, I don't know him, but I can look him up or whatever. But when they say, sit down with Joe Schmo, you go, oh, I got nothing to look up here. <laughs> Where do I right. come up with questions, right? Right, or if you don't even know their name. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Other than when they said, you know, blah, 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 on vocals and guitar, you know, it's like, okay, and that is who? Right. I, you know, it's so kind of... So your first question is, so you sing in Peter Chris's band. Tell me about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, you're right, exactly. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, l l let's keep moving through them there. Uh, uh, did, did we say Ace Fraley yet? We did not. Uh, Ace Fraley. No, we did not. But I, I just want to give you a, just, just real quick back to Peter. Right. When I finally did get a chance to talk to Peter, my first question to him is I asked him as a human being to another human being, how are you knowing that his father had just passed away? Right. And his response to that is he got offended. And he's like, well, what do you mean, how am I? Can't you see I'm doing great? Don't I look great? I just bought a $40,000 Mitsubishi. I'm living the life. I'm doing great. And it really got off to a bad uh, rapport between him and I. And see, I don't think he understood that, you know, I'm not asking, you know, Peter, are, are you homeless like the report said in 1991? Right. I'm asking you, knowing your father just died a few days ago, you know, how are you doing? How are, how are you managing staying out on tour with just having such a, you know, uh, uh, you know heavy thing happen so, so in your life? So he came off and as somewhat defensive then? Very defensive. Oh. Very, very defensive. And, and, and again, I think with the way that, you know, him instructing me to interview his other band members and then being defensive, it just wasn't a great interview. So I have to say with Peter, um, as far as all of my interview experiences, I'd have to put that at, at the bottom as far as, well, uh, you know, <laughs> it's well, my favorite. Uh, how about Eric Singer then? I know I said Ace Fraley, but let's go Ace to Eric Fraley. Singer first. Let's go to Ace okay. Eric Singer. We'll, we'll work our way up to the ones, you know, Ace and, and Paul. I'm sure everybody wants sure. to hear that. Um, sure. Sure. Um, Eric Singer, I would have to say at this point in time, Eric Singer is probably the person that I am closest to in, in the band. Right. Um, when the situation, uh, rose in 96, when, um, there was the reunion tour. Um, again, I don't know, you know, if people know this or not, but essentially Gene and Paul did not really know whether or not the reunion tour 
was going to be the success that it was. Right. So what they had done is actually put Bruce and Eric on a retainer for a year where they were being paid to essentially do nothing. Right. During that time, they weren't allowed to play with any other artists. They weren't allowed to record with any other artists. Right. They were not allowed to do anything musically for one year. Okay. Which as a musician, if you're a musician out there and you're listening to this, if you can imagine being a working musician, all of a sudden being told, well, you know what? We're going to pay you not what you were making when you were playing, but we're going to pay you a smaller amount to do nothing, you know? So for Eric Singer, who's always been a working musician and playing in so many bands, it was a, it was a very difficult time for him. And during that time, I wound up becoming very good friends with him and we would talk on a daily basis. And it wouldn't be like, you know, I'm interviewing Eric Singer, which I had done and, you know, met him, you know, uh, many years prior to that time. Um, but it was just, you know, building a friendship and we would be talking about, you know, like what was going on and what he could and could not do. So what I wound up doing for Eric during that time is I wound up getting him to be a guest at his very first KISS Expo, right. or at the time there were, I think, conventions. They were still allowed to be called conventions at that time. Um, and I got him his very first KISS convention appearance Where here was in that? Buffalo. In Buffalo, okay. Yep, in October of 96. Because he was allowed to do that, he just couldn't do anything musically. He couldn't, like I said, he couldn't record or, or perform with any other, you know, uh, name artist. But you got to perform with him. I did. I did. Because what had happened was that, you know, prior to that, you know, they would have, you know, Ace and Peter before they returned to the band, they would go up there and they would play the songs they were part of. And typically when you go to a KISS convention, you'd have a KISS tribute band right. that would be playing all the songs essentially from the 70s. Right. And I thought it would be kind of a slight to Eric Singer for him to come up and perform with the tribute band and only play 70s music, which wasn't his time. When he, although he did play a lot of 70s songs when he was in Kiss, you know, there was also, uh, you know, material that he, he recorded with the band and, you know, kind of made his own during his time in the band. And I thought that it would be a lot cooler when he came up to play that he played those songs as opposed to playing, you know, uh, original era Kiss material. So what I wound up doing is I wound up um, getting together with the Kiss tribute band, because uh, I'm a guitar player, and well, you're um, an ace. I am. <laughs> I am. I, I. 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 I am a fan of all the Kiss guitar players, and to an extent, I since I started playing guitar, um, which I started playing almost the same time, if not earlier, than I started doing the Kiss Underground. You know, I started trying to learn and emulate the different styles of the of the different. Kiss guitar players, and um, you know, so I as much as I love Ace, and currently I portray Ace in a Kiss tribute band here in Buffalo called Kiss This. Um, I actually also, you know, learned and got familiar with you know the songs that Bruce Kulick played, his style of lead guitar playing, and you know, I even went to the extent where I would purchase the type of guitars that they used just to really get a sense of what, what their actual style is. Yeah. You know, it's like because, you know, Bruce Kulick, when he was in KISS, he was, you know, uh, for the majority of the time was a, a Stratocaster type player with, uh, you know, Floyd Rose tremolo system as opposed to, you know, Ace Frehley, who, you know, always played Gibson Les Pauls and, you know, and, and it's really different, um, approach as far as with vibrato and the sound and, you know, if you're a guitar player, you know what I'm talking about. If you're, if you're not a musician, you might think a guitar is a guitar is a guitar, but a, as a guitar player, it's really not. There's a, there's a lot to uh, it. 
there's nuances to the whole thing. Now I see that we're 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 creeping up on the one hour mark. So let's let let's let, let's go with the last few questions. So we'll get to Vinny, Ace, and Paul, and then if you can tell me why did you decide to wrap up the Kiss Underground in two thousand seven? Okay. Uh, well, let, let's let's so let's just finish with the with those three guys. Uh, we'll, we'll do uh, Vinny, Ace, and then we'll finish with Paul. Okay, and, and if I can, I just wanted to wrap up what I was saying with uh, with Eric Singer because I really didn't right. get an opportunity to to let you know how that kind of all um, played out. Right. But what I wound up doing is 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 I wound up playing with the Kiss tribute band that was going to be performing at the expo, and I went down and I made them learn Domino and Creatures of the Night. Because although Eric Carr was the original drummer, it, when Eric Singer first joined the band is when Kiss actually revived that song into the set list after not you know, playing it for a, a few years. Yeah, a and really he could song. kind of put his own, own spin on it. And so I thought it was, was a, a nice tribute to Eric to be able to play songs that he was more of a part of. So that, you know, that's how things went. And, um, you know, and as far as, you know, my relationship with Eric, he's always been a good friend and he's always been respectful to everything that I've done with the Kiss Underground. And also he's helped me now with, you know, right now what I'm currently doing uh, as far as in a journalistic aspect right. is I write for a website called rockmusicstar.com. Right. And he's helped, you know, provide me with some really exclusive stuff. In fact, I think the interview that I did with Eric right after the monster album came out was the first, um, actually response to all the negative things that Peter Chris had put in his book about the band members and specifically when he, uh, attacked Eric and called him a schlep, you know, I wanted Eric to have a, a, a public platform to be able to respond to, you know, being attacked, you know, in the way that Peter did. So, you know, like I said, Eric's been a great friend and he's also been, you know, helpful to, you know, everything that I've tried to do, you know, uh, from a, you know, journalistic as aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Vinnie Vincent? Vinnie Vincent? Uh, Vinnie Vincent is a very strange character. Um... The, the odd thing is that if you read anything on the internet about him now, most of it is true. I, and I'm sorry to say that. I think Vinny is a great talent. I think he's a great songwriter. His guitar playing, it, some people like it, some people don't. Um, and the thing is, is that there's he, he's just a, a very strange person i mean when i would call and try to, to set up a, an interview with Vinny, i would be calling the the metal luna you know his his record company right. you know later on i would be calling metal luna and i'd have various people answering the phone that i'd be talking to that all suspiciously sounded like Vinny vincent oh so you spoke to meredith yeah, but her name wasn't Meredith at the time. It was, I, I honestly don't remember what her name was. Uh, but the thing was, it was just a very odd situation. But again, to Vinny's credit, though, um, I did get the opportunity to interview him. I did get the opportunity to spend time with him. And although people um, said that his, his uh, conduct was very... Um, unprofessional mm -hmm. during the expo, uh, I guess the expo tour that he had done in, in the latter part of 96 mm -hmm. in, over in Europe. When he did the expo here in Buffalo, New York, and I believe I think it was either 94 or 95, I spent the whole day with Vinny. Um, I actually painted my face in Vinny's makeup as like a tribute to him, you know, which he got a kick out of. And, and, and I think kind of like his ego thing, it was almost like he kept looking at me, like he was looking at himself throughout the day, you know, with me wearing his makeup. And, um, but I, I spent the whole day with them and the guy couldn't have been a nicer guy. So I really can't say anything negative mm -hmm. in, in that respect. But like I said, just in terms of, dealing with him as far as like trying to set up interviews and going through his management and his label. I think everything was just really him 
under the guise of pretending to be different people, which I, I just, you know, I found to be very strange. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that from a million different people that the whole Vinny Vincent Corporation is basically Vinny with 18 different names. Now, I can't prove it. I've never sought to prove it. I don't really care. But yeah, I've heard that story before, which is sort of bizarre in, in its own way. Uh, Ace Fraley. Ace Fraley? I mean, Ace is Ace. You you you, you get what you see. Um, it, you know, unfortunately, you know, when, when I interviewed him was um was during the the 90s and he was still obviously using and abusing drugs and alcohol during that time which you know to me looking back you know it was sad but at the same time I'm I'm while I'm glad that he got sober honestly that and I hate to even say it or or, or the way the ace was with the partying and drinking, that was ace. That was his personality. That was his persona. The the unpredictability about him added to, I think, the, the attraction and mystique of, of who he was as a person, as a performer. I mean, when, when I went to go see Ace's first shows when he got sober in 2008, it wasn't the same guy that I saw, you know, in, in, in the nineties or even during the, the kiss reunion era, it was a very different person. It was somebody who was, you know, trying to reconnect with themselves at a, on a musical level, trying to figure out how to do the whole thing sober. Whereas for so many years, decades, they were doing it, you know, uh, you know, on different chemicals and, and alcohol, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was just, different and, and interviewing ace during that time you know he's like any one of the interviews that you would see from him from the you know 80s or 90s that he had great sense of humor he he wouldn't refuse to answer any question you know it was he was just a, a fun guy right and, and of course that said uh, i would rather take a healthy sober ace who never played guitar again than somebody who was completely wasted on, you know, I mean, listen, we wish him the best and, and, you know, hopefully that he stays sober, right? I mean, that's, that's, oh, yeah. that's important. Um, Paul Stanley. Paul, um, Paul is a much more open and nicer guy than honestly, than people give him credit for. Right. Um, you know, as of late, he's gotten a lot of criticism because he's been active in the social media, mm -hmm. um, responding perhaps people he shouldn't respond to who make asinine comments in a disrespectful manner. Um, but at the same time, if the guy doesn't respond to when people are, are contacting him socially, you know, in the media, then he's going to be being accused of being an aloof, out of contact rock star who thinks that they're too good to deal with the common people. Right. And then if he does, and, and you know, he, when he's being attacked and he responds in a very human manner, he gets criticized for doing that. So I, I don't think there's, there's, he's kind of like in a lose, lose situation where he is with that. But I have to say my situations with Paul in terms of interviewing him, he's always been very, very nice, very open. Although he, he I do have to admit he is guarded with his responses. Right. You can always tell when you ask Paul Stanley a question that he's almost before you're done asking the question, he's already come up with a way that he's decided how he wants to answer your question. I mean, the guy is a, a complete pro at doing interviews and he knows exactly how to answer something. And if he doesn't want to answer something, he knows how to still provide you with an answer without actually even answering the question. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and that's what, uh, you know, that's what a lot of the, uh, rock stars or, or whatever you want to call them they they know how to sidestep an issue politely and still give you a good interview sure and and you you can't blame them for that i mean sometimes no. people ask completely stupid questions and and you 
you have to politely answer them at the same time while saying, listen, it's none of your business. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Yeah. No. Uh, and, and then, so 2007 rolls around. The internet's in full force. People aren't sending ten bucks to you anymore for 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 Kiss Underground or for any of you know magazine. Uh, is, is that sort of why you chose to wrap it up, or was it just because listen, I've got a family and kids, and life is moving on, and I can't? Why'd you wrap it up? Actually, it was you know the funny thing it was quite opposite. Um, I wound up having more people asking me why am I stopping than, you know, than, than the other scenario where it, it, it just didn't seem feasible anymore. Right. Um, I, the, the truthful answer was that right at the time when I stopped doing the Kiss Underground was when Kiss Online changed regime, when Mike Branvold, your right. buddy, right. When, he, uh, when he stepped down or was asked to step down and was replaced um, with, with Keith, Keith LaRue, um, the band at that point in time were very adamant in trying to reestablish Kiss Online as far as what it is as a website, how would it would connect with the fans, mm -hmm. and if you remember back then, they were they were really trying to do a lot of things like you know ask Paul and you know things like that, you know really um, right, you know, friendly, yeah, re really trying to reestablish the site in every possible way that they could. And what wound up happening, unfortunately, was other KISS, um, at this point, I, I have to specify that I had switched formats. I had stopped publishing the KISS Underground as a fan scene, and I started my own KISS Underground website. Right. And the main reason for that was simply that the way with the internet that you, you could just get information instantaneously for me to have a part of the Kiss Underground called a news section, to have a news section that, you know, if it took me, say, two months after the point of having everything put together and printed up and mailed out, they get a, a fanzine that has news that's two months ago when you can literally go online and you can read what happened two minutes ago. Right. It just kind of seemed redundant. You know, you know what I'm saying? And as far as, you know, if somebody wants photos, you know, I mean, what essentially what the Kiss Underground was is I, by the very end, as I was, you know, doing it where I had a color, full color cover, but all of, you know, the content inside was all black and white. So it's like, you know, it's like I'm sending them, you know, photos that, you know, like you were saying before, you can go on Google and you can type in Kiss photo from whatever era, whatever tour, and you're going to get 6,000 photos. You know, you can go and you can click on one of those. You can save it on your hard drive. And if you want that picture, you can go print it out. You know what I'm saying? You can have anything that you want. So essentially what I feel what I was able to provide in a print format was kind of becoming the way of the dinosaur. You know, so that's why I switched to doing, you know, online. And what wound up happening, though, was in 2007, was that with KISS Online trying to reestablish themselves, is a lot of the events and things that I would be invited to and that I would have exclus exclusivity to cover with the KISS Underground. Unfortunately, I was being denied by their management in being told that this is a KISS Online exclusive. This is a KISS Online exclusive. This is a KISS Online. You know, right. aside from still being able to interview the band members, which they allowed me to do, which was great, other things like other events that the band was doing, I was being denied access to. And essentially, I felt that the KISS Underground website was being looked at as kind of almost competition right. to kiss online. And that's not what my intention was. Right. My intention was simply to continue what I was doing with the kiss underground, but on, in an, you know, online format. Right. That's, that's what my intention was. I never was like, well, I, I want to have a, you know, and I think there might be some people out there who do have their kiss websites where their intention is trying to outdo kiss online, you know? Um, but for me, that wasn't where I was coming from. I just wanted to continue the Kiss Underground in a way that made sense, so I continued it online. But unfortunately, like I said, w with the timing of you know Kiss Online 
reestablishing themselves as a website and having a new webmaster and everything, it just got to the point where it's like, you know, I'm not going to try to compete with KISS or KISS Online. So that's when I decided just to, to end the KISS Underground. So overall, uh, in the 20 years, it sounds to me that it, w- it was a great experience, right? Oh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, and the thing is, you know, even through all the years when I finally was getting, you know, like I said, the, the free advertising from Kiss and their magazines and, you know, getting all the subscribers and people would send in money. The one thing that I never did as things got more expensive I never really raised the cost of my prescri- the, subscription. the subscription rather, mm-hmm. you know, I charged uh, $8 for a year, which, you know, and I never, you know, never changed that. No, I, I it, it wasn't something where, you know, it's like I, I kept, you know, I would say, hey, you know, the, the cost, you know, what my cost for printing is going up. So now I need to contact all of my subscribers and say, hey, you know, uh, I know I only charged you $8 this year, but I'm going to need you to send me more. You know, I never did anything like that at all. I just kept it the same amount. So, I mean, realistically, probably the Kiss Underground throughout the 20 years cost me money as opposed to me making money on it but the experiences invaluable yes and 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 to be able to establish any type of relationship with the band that i grew up you know idolizing as a kid and the fact that i can look back and say when i was 15 years old i said you know what I want to be able to ask Kiss, the members of Kiss, questions. I want to be able to meet them. I would love to get my photo with them. I would love to get, you know, my memorabilia autographed. And the fact that I was able to accomplish that and more, like I said, being able to perform on stage with the drummer of Kiss, playing Creatures of the Night with Eric Singer, playing Domino with Eric Singer, you know, playing guitar with Eric Singer. I mean, you know, and, and also I even, um, my band, uh, I had a, at one point an Ace Frehley uh, tribute band called Space Ace that was a non makeup band, and we wound up playing at the Toronto uh, Kiss Expo in 2002. And Richie Scarlett was so impressed with the band that he wanted to come up and he performed with us. Right. So I got to play with Richie Scarlett as well. And I don't think that. Honestly, I ever would have had the opportunity for those type of experiences without the Kiss Underground. If it, without the Kiss Underground. So, uh, just to end off here, if people want to find you online, or, or, or maybe some of this stuff that you might have from the Kiss Underground, can where can they find you? Ah, uh, they can find me on Facebook. Right. Uh, they can they can find me uh, on my you know my I'm not uh, you know in hiding or anything like that. They can just look me up under my name John Jeffrey, J O H N J E F F R E Y. Um, if anybody would like to read, um, and, you know any of the writing that I'm continuing to do. Again, the website is rockmusicstar.com, in which we also have our Facebook page for that. And um, if you want to come and see me portray Ace Frehley, um, name of the band again is Kiss This. And the again, we used to be before we started wearing the makeup, we were a non-makeup Ace Frehley uh, tribute band. So the name of our Facebook page, it would be facebook.com uh, space ace buffalo. So that's go. how they can find you know, any information about Kiss This, and um, I'm more than willing to, uh, you know, to talk with other fans. You know, I, I uh, you know, I sometimes I post on the Kiss FAQ um, form um, under Ace Clone, and, um, you know, like I said, you know, I'm still a fan to this day. You know, and, and, and I enjoy being a KISS fan. It's not because I feel like I have to be one, right. which, which it, to me, I, I sometimes read what some of, you know, what they call themselves KISS fans say and are so negative. And I think to myself, I'm like, you know what? If you want to still be a KISS fan, that's great. But if there was something that I disliked so much today, I would find something else that I liked to spend my time on as opposed to writing 
or, you know, posting about something that I just don't like anymore. Well, you know, I, just, I, I think that the saying is, uh, hate's not the opposite of love, indifference is. And I think those, those, those haters, I think they love the band so much, but they just maybe don't know how to show it. So they lash out for some reason. But, you know, there you go. John? Or, or like I said, I feel, it seems like they almost feel compelled. Like nobody's forcing you to still be a Kiss fan. No. Yeah, you know, it's a as, as Gene and Paul have always said, it's a volunteer army. Yeah, you know, if you want to be in, that's fine. If not, you know, there's more than a, enough things on this earth to do aside from following Kiss or being a Kiss fan. Yeah, so. Absolutely. So, John, thank you again. Been a been a pleasure. Oh, and, thanks, uh, thanks. Yeah. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time and. You know, I'm flattered that, you know, you asked me to do this interview and um, I always, you know, appreciated all of your work from your website Thank to, uh, you know, what you did on, uh, you know, three sides of the coin right. and, um, you know, and, and even the current uh, interviews that you've been posting on YouTube now. I think it's great stuff. And um, if anybody hasn't checked out your work, they're missing out. Well, listen, I'll agree with that. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> no, the, the reason I want to talk to you is because, uh, you know, a lot of the interviews I've done and a lot of the interviews you'll read is always about the band member or the ghost guitarist or the... It's always people that are in the industry. And I thought this would be a very interesting perspective to take a guy who, you know, was sitting around his living room one day and said, I'm going to create a magazine. And, and it just... That that dedication and that 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 sort of entrepreneurship entrepreneurialship boy that's a tough word for the afternoon to, say, <laughs> um, to to put something together and not only did it work but then it was embraced by the band I mean they're paying for advertising in magazines for you they're 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 giving you interviews which you know a lot of people can't get they're just and you know here you were one day in your living room said hey. Kiss magazine sounds like a good idea, and that to me is an interesting story. That to, to to get it to fruition and to make it last for twenty years. I mean, you know, some people after three months they're like, "All right, I've been there, done that." But you made it last for twenty years. It's a compelling story. Yeah, well, it's it's my life, and I wouldn't change it for anything. That's right. It's a great song too. It's my life. Um, thank you, John. You're welcome. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye.